Hello friends, I'm Kayla. I'm here today to ask the question, do first impressions matter? Now obviously first impressions matter as in you read the first chapter of a book and if it's good you're probably going to keep reading and if it's bad you might not ever pick it back up. My question is more does the first chapter indicate what the rating of the overall book is going to be? Earlier this year I read the first chapter of all 100 books on my TBR shelf and I gave them a rating from 0 to 10 as far as initial intrigue. I have read over 20 from the shelf now and I've given them their own ratings and we can compare that but I want to have a good sample size so I'm going to go with 30 and at the end of the video once I have successfully read 30 books off of my TBR shelf we're going to create a little spreadsheet and see how the first chapter compared to the overall rating that I gave the book. But first I need to pick some things for this video to read so I'm going to select a book from each of the numbers that I gave. A book that I gave a 10 out of 10, a 9, an 8, a 7, a 6, and a 5 because I think that's the lowest I went without unhauling something. The way I organize my TBR shelf after that is I put every book that I gave a 5, 6, and 7 out of 10 on this bottom shelf here and then everything that I gave an 8, 9, and 10 I put up here. And most of the books that I've already read that we can put in the spreadsheet are ones from this top shelf so I need to pick a couple from the lower one as well. And the comments were so great because especially the books that I gave under a 7 and ended up on the bottom shelf or ones that were in consideration of unhauling people added their comments and told me which ones I needed to give another chance. So I have held on to a couple sixes and fives. I don't think I have any fours remaining um, but we're going to start with picking the 10 out of 10. Don't worry I'm not going to spend a lot of time pulling out the contenders for every single number. It's just this one is really interesting to me and makes me excited that there are only five of these left that I originally gave that a 10 out of 10. I did do a second video for channel members where I redid the entire thing with like the 20 books that I had hauled since that original video. So I guess technically I do have seven that I gave a 10 out of 10, but my goal for this video was to pull from the original selection, not the follow-up video. Although I might have to slide like one in from the second video. Now, yes, standing here right now and looking at this stack, I am rethinking this whole thing and like I just want to read all of the ones that I gave a 10 out of 10 and this could be a video on its own. But I have selected Leech because I also feel motivated to pick something from a different genre for each of the numbers to make this video like a really broad range of things so I can read all of my favorite stuff. And these will happen someday. I promise. And this decision was really easy because it was voted on by my channel members as our besties book club pick for the season. We have a seasonal buddy read that we talk about in a live show at the end of the three month span. And I'm really excited to get into this one. It's like horror sci-fi. Moving on from 10, we have nine and eight. I think that's the most, those are the most common ratings that I gave out. So I could really choose a plethora of things. So we're going to go over to the general fiction section. And I'm gonna go with such a fun age. I gave a lot of general fiction a nine, so there were so many things to choose from. And there's not a ton of this genre in other numbers. So I've had this on my TBR for many years and I'm gonna be reading Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed. For the eight spot, I am finally gonna read something from my mystery stack. I know, it's incredible. <laughs> I've really been sleeping on mystery thrillers. I'm so sorry. The Villa by Rachel Hawkins is gonna finally happen this week and I'm so excited to get into it. First chapter of this, truly nothing happened. Um, and I maybe don't even know what the plot is, but I do know that the last Rachel Hawkins I read, I gave a higher rating than a lot of my friends. So I think maybe Rachel Hawkins is for me. And we're gonna test that with the Villa. The seventh spot is really hard because I know the one that everybody wants me to read. And I don't know if I'm prepared yet. And genuinely, if we're talking fantasy, there are other fantasy options here that I gave a seven that maybe I do feel more called to. However, I can't think of any other video that I'm gonna fit this into. So like, why not take the opportunity to finally finish out the entire Maggie Steve Otter, Raven Boys Dreamer trilogy situation with Grey Warren. Now for number six, this is the one that I kind of let the comments lead me to because I had a couple sixes in the stack of ones that I was considering getting rid of. There was fours, fives, and sixes in there. And a couple of people said that the first chapter did not really indicate how this book was gonna go for me. And that's the whole test here. So I thought, I'll hold on to it. Let me go grab it. I shoved it in the TBR closet, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> and that's Winter Counts. So this was months ago now, so I don't really remember the first chapter, but I do recall it being high action and caught me off guard a little bit. I think I am veering away from just like the heavy action 
crime fiction mystery genre. So I'm very excited to now be able to get past that first chapter and see what the story actually is because obviously it was meant to grab your attention. It did but in like a negative way for me I guess. So this is my selection for six and then for five I also have a little handful to choose from but none of these feel like the right thing to read in this video. I am reading this turns out for my book club I just made that decision so that's a couple months from now I'm not going to read it right now. I already have a mystery slotted in I already have a horror slotted in and that's all I have to choose from from the original video so I'm gonna go with the secondary video because I also have to read this this month because it was picked out of my members TBR jar some of you may see where this is going and it's the genre that's missing here sci-fi. So I'm going with Skyward by Brandon Sanderson. It wasn't that the first chapter really turned me off from this book, which is why I didn't, you know, immediately DNF it or get rid of it. But I think at the time I had just been reading too much high fantasy and science fiction and my mind was not prepared to learn all the things and so I didn't feel invested right away. But we will see as I continue in here if it's a huge win or not. So here's my TBR for the week. We've got a 5 all the way to a 10 and I'm excited to see at the end of it if this indeed is. Well I rate by fives so that kind of messes this all up. I think I need to readjust the numbers like let's say I gave this a five, I gave this a four, four and a half, a four, a three and a half, a three, and a two and a half and we'll see if by the end those ratings stay consistent or if the first chapter did not indicate how I was going to feel about the book by the end. I don't even know what the mystery is yet. We have these two women who are best friends. They're both authors, but in very different areas, genres, and success. They just have lunch together for the first time in a while, and there's something about their dynamic that just makes me want to continue reading. I totally forgot to mention in the intro that this video was originally submitted by channel member Nicole. So thank you so much for giving me this idea. Everyone seemed to like it. And I'm starting like not in order. I'm gonna start with the number eight position or the book that got the 8 out of 10, The Villa by Rachel Hawkins, just because I feel like I'm in the mood for mystery thriller type stuff. And it's interesting, I've started this now, I'm 30% in, and it feels like such a mix between two of my most recent book club selections, uh, The Only One Left by Riley Sager and The Writing Retreat by Julia Bartz, because we are following these two women and they go to this villa together as like a mini writing retreat where they're just supposed to be inspired by the location and each other to get their work done. So it's giving the vibes of the writing retreat and also these women in their like weird relationship, friendship, obsession with each other maybe. And then it also has this true crime element because the villa itself is this murder house. And much like in here, you're reading the origin story of what happened and how the murder took place and all of the people involved. And normally our main character, Emily, writes cozy mysteries. That's her thing. She has this whole series and she is being inspired by this murder house in Italy and the events that maybe took place there. They're staying there and she found this library full of books and there's a book that she's reading and then we get chapters from that book and we find out like what was happening to lead up to these events and maybe she can successfully write a book about it and feel like she is as successful as her best friend Chess. Chess writes self-help, self-improvement, is very much well known for that and has this certain persona that Emily doesn't quite believe and trust and they kind of make fun of it sometimes but then at other times Chess takes it very seriously and it makes us wonder as the reader if Chess is inviting her on this trip with her and paying for everything in like an actual kind friendship way or if she has something more sinister planned. It's also fun because you get emails and like news articles and things not super often like the whole book is not epistolary it's not mixed media fully because the majority of it is just a first person narrative but there's also these podcast moments telling the true crime story of this house and I haven't even read the back but glancing at it now it says it's inspired by Fleetwood Mac the Manson murders and the infamous summer Percy and Mary Shelley spent with Lord Byron at a Lake Geneva castle and because I'm not a big true crime girly I'm probably not even going to make all of the connections that there clearly are but in the 1974 storyline you are reading about this like band and artists and they're working on their music and I didn't know it would be about celebrities I didn't know that would be a portion of it but right now it's just them in their more artsy career than famous career so I think it's all interesting 
and I have no idea like where the story is gonna go. I can imagine what's gonna happen in the past, but I'm sure there are surprising things to come. And I really don't know what's gonna happen current day. So I'll check in with you at another third of the way through. I am only checking in with you because I said I would. I don't really have anything more to say. There have definitely been learnings in the last third, but I don't think anything is much more exciting. I think the last third is going to be where there's like reveals and exciting maybe situations people are getting into. Right now we're just learning a lot and there's a lot of tension between so many people. So in the past storyline there are a couple women fighting over you know different men and in the current day storyline there's maybe things that are reflecting that. Um, the women are fighting over something as well and there is a lot of talk of writing this book and the fight kind of over the creativity of it um, because one of them actually wants to write a book together. And there's also drama and legal implications with writing a book and um, like a previous spouse and a share of like creative ownership. So there's a lot of things going on. I feel like it's one of those cases where you have dual timelines and you sometimes just are more interested in one than the other. I am much more interested in the current day situation, but I feel like as the book goes on, we're seeing Emily and Chess less and less. And I'm gonna wrap it up. It's a fast read. It's keeping my attention. I'm just like losing a little bit of interest every chapter that goes by. I'm gonna film me reading the last couple chapters in case something shocking is revealed and I can get it on camera. <laughs> story was going I think reading Reckless Girls and how the first like 50% of it is just a drama and then it gets thrilling and interesting and there are all of these things going on it's more thriller than mystery from what I remember like there's actually action sequences so I figured this was going in the same direction and it was slow and there were some questions that you had as the reader um, but then it was going to get thrilling and it didn't um, it didn't at all it didn't even a little bit in fact it didn't even let us be there for the scenes that would have been thrilling thrilling scenes happened off page and that was really just disappointing because if this is a mystery, there wasn't that much of a mystery. Like there was one interesting reveal that you could see coming from a mile away. And then there was like a thrilling plot point, but we didn't really get to read it. So there is something that like happened that was unexpected, I guess, but like it, it wasn't good. But at the same time, I loved those two characters and their dynamic. That's why the first chapter worked for me so much is because I was just so fascinated by their friendship, much like the writing retreat, much like uh, So Happy For You. Female friendship is just always so interesting, especially when it's toxic. That's something that makes you continue to read the next chapter to see what's going to come out of it all. And that just really let me down. I thought it would be a four because I was thinking something was coming that would make it a four. Instead, it's gonna stay at like the three that it already was. This was a drama. This was not a mystery thriller. It was a drama. And I feel like we don't talk about that genre enough. Like Leanne Moriarty books, there's one moment and there's a couple little reveals, but they are just dramatic relationships through the bulk of the story. So at the end of the day, this one I gave a three and I predicted based on the first chapter and what I gave the first chapter was a four. So these ones did not match up perfectly, but it wasn't too incredibly far off. So that's the results from read number one.
I think I'm gonna have to give it a 10 just because I want to continue. We have a main character who's talking about they live in this place and now they're coming back to the place with a different face and they're investigating a death that they themselves like should have witnessed but they just weren't there for it. Nobody there recognizes them. And there's a dead body and it was killed by perhaps this creature that he like pulls out of their eyeball. And then the first chapter ends with the line, it appears I have a competitor. Which like, what does that mean? Is he, did he, did sh they want to kill this person? Do these creatures belong to them? I have no idea. Very intrigued. The next book I was gonna read for this video was actually Grey Warren and I started it and I posted a picture on Instagram saying today's the day. And then I got like the first two chapters in and I just wasn't, I wasn't feeling like reading. I took a couple days off from reading. There's a lot of forest fire things happening. I kind of talked about this in my last vlog. But now it's a few days later and I need to get back to my reading for this video. And so I went to pay up Grey Warren and then I was like, my live show is tomorrow <laughs> for Leech. So I should probably read this one. Um, I still don't know a quarter of the way in if this is even conducive to a discussion because I have no idea what's going on. I'm highlighting so much and it reminds me interestingly of Gideon the Ninth and just the feeling of reading it, like not really knowing what is happening. And that author, Tasman Moore, has blurbed right on the cover. A wonderful new entry to gothic science fiction. Think Wuthering Heights with worms. Indeed, the worms are here. So we have this like doctor. And also like, I don't know what's considered a spoiler for this because I don't know where the story is going at all. I have no idea what's going on. But we have this doctor who is going and investigating um, parasites. And I guess that is their job. But there have been different iterations of this doctor and like the doctor just died and now they're going to investigate the doctor's death, but it's actually their own death. And people aren't supposed to know that it's always the doctor. So the, like new doctors will constantly come and work on this like investigation and there's a laboratory and there's all of this sciencey stuff happening and so they're trying to keep their identity a secret, I guess. They also don't have a name, but they're always talking about this like medical institute and how they are like a created being and that everyone who comes up in this institute has the ability to like share a mind. And so every time they talk, they're like, oh, one of my many eyes is looking over here. Oh, I felt that all of my hearts are beating, but it's like clearly just one entity that we're talking about. <laughs> I feel so stupid talking about this. And so part of doing the live show, I'm thinking this isn't conducive because like, is there even a story here to follow? What are we gonna talk about? But also, am I intelligent enough to have a conversation about this? So wish me luck getting through it today. Uh, I have like 24 hours until I need to discuss this with many people who I forced to read it with me. I mean, technically they picked it for the Besties Book Club. All I know is the next Besties Book Club, it's seasonal. Uh, it's gonna be something lighter and something fun. I don't know if we'll go to romance. I don't know if we'll go to like a cozy fantasy. That could be fun. But this, I've already seen people say they DNF'd it, I think because it was confusing and also because the graphic nature of it is a little too much. Let me read you a passage. This doctor's like digging in a body. Slightly to the left of his sternum, awkward as a third nipple, sits a nub of rounded silver. I twist it between gloved fingers, cracking the dried discharge and flaked skin, and with a short hiss, the head comes loose. Just my grip and pull. The tube slips out, covered in fresh and clotted blood. His head slumps back and his heart ceases to function. So there's something killing people, and I guess they need to figure out what it is. But like, we already know it's a parasite. But I guess it's like an unknown, unfamiliar parasite that isn't in any of the Institute's books or logs. So now they need to investigate and like dissect the nasty parasites that are also trying to kill the doctor, probably. Maybe I do understand what's happening, but uh, we'll see where it goes. Hello, it's pajama time. And I'm still only halfway through the book. Don't ask me how, because I feel like I've been reading this for the past five hours straight, but I'm only 170 pages in. Uh, it's dense. It's from one character's perspective pretty much the entire time. It's just internal monologue and thoughts 
the entire time. There is plot, like things are happening. And I have a little system for post-its now because I wanted to tab things that I wanted to remember like plot wise, things that actually move things forward, things that are happening. Mostly the learnings about the parasites, the creatures, the pathogen itself. And then I did orange for like world building or um, how would I explain it? Just like explanations of things because you're dropped into chaos and you're just supposed to go along with it and I think that's fine and as it goes you learn more things about like the doctor and the agreement that they have made and then the chateau where they're staying and various like family members and people there's a priest there is what did it call him? The houseboy, Emil, who doesn't speak, um, but him and the doctor seem to have a very clear communication style where he can just gesture or make some sort of face and the doctor completely understands what he's trying to say. He's a very like soft, kind-hearted character and I love him a lot, but I don't know where I don't know what's really happening. <laughs> and then we have a little bit of storytelling. So I also like can't pronounce what the people of this area are called, but there are some stories that are being told like by the priest and just like background of all of these characters. And then my like limey green, yellow, they look yellow to you, so that's fine. Uh, Post-its are for just beautiful language or just well done sentences. So, for example, the author doesn't just say, my stomach dropped. They say, when I stand, my stomach stays seated. And winter is taking its first deep breath. I can feel it from here to the southern floodlands and back, and soon will come the great exhale. There are some ideas of what it means to be human in here. Um, just as I need others, I am needed. To be needed, I suspect, is fundamental to being human. And like, if... Like what is human in here? We've also gotten into some like gender conversations, which makes sense um, with the author and with the kind of genderless, nameless doctor. And we're getting into conversations about how that came to be and how everything is set up. Um, and I hope it goes further with like certain conversations. And also I wonder if it's gonna touch on like autonomy in some way because the idea of this institute is that all of these people have like they share this this mind and that's how they're raised is to one day be able to be a doctor or take over for the last doctor and they all share this thing but did they choose that are they being raised in it and forced into it i definitely continue to be interested i continue to be a little bit lost this isn't like anything that I read before and it has such a clear atmosphere. Somehow the cover completely embodies the feeling of reading this book. It feels cold. It feels desaturated. It feels like you are in just this sanitized chateau and everything dark and deadly is trapped inside but is slowly seeping out. I just had my live show for Leech with my channel members and so many of us enjoyed this. Uh, there was quite a good handful of fives, including my own. This ended up being both one of the most unique stories I've ever read, but also a combination of so many of my favorite things. Like it had the kind of collective consciousness that Bunny has. It had the like fungal nature, what moves the dead, and Mexican Gothic. There's something about Gideon the Ninth maybe the writing style, maybe just how you're confused, especially for the first half of it. And it's kind of spacey, futuristic. The death of Jane Lawrence and the clinical nature of it in a gothic manner, totally. The conversations about medical exploitation that Lakewood brings. The almost possession and like, can I trust my own mind that a possession story or come closer specifically has. And then there was something that made me think of Slufa, maybe certain descriptions of creatures and there being a character that you really feel for and your heartstrings are pulled the whole time that everything just made leech such a perfect read for me the conversations about gender as i thought came full circle it had some things to say about humanity especially just the fight for survival and the desperation to continue and keep going and i love that so much in books when you have a character who 
is kind of cold, robotic, um, maybe like physically they are being controlled by something other than their humanity and their humanity just perseveres through that. There was also a lot of unexpected talk about consent and bodily autonomy that goes beyond what I was talking about before. Uh, there were certain reveals in here that were absolutely heartbreaking and about stopping cycles like many different cycles not just cycles of abuse or trauma but beyond that a lot of things that would like reveal the actual plot of this book and it just had a lot of great things to say like on page we're saying it and then just a lot of things for you to think about after i'm so excited that officially the book that i gave the 10 out of 10 for intrigue got a 10 out of 10 or a 5 out of 5 so this one completely matched my expectations and i couldn't be happier so hopefully the next one also does that Maybe I'll go to another highly rated one so we can kick it off with all of the good vibes. I actually just got the, um, my hold came in for the audiobook from my library for such a fun age. So lucky me. This is so intriguing. I think I'm going to give it a nine. I knew what the synopsis was and the first chapter really just was the synopsis. It's following a 20 something black woman and she is babysitting for a white family and at the grocery store somebody accuses her of kidnapping this child somebody films it and then she calls the dad to come like save the day and that was pretty much it so all i read was the synopsis but in narrative form and i'm hooked okay today i will be reading such a fun age the first I have a dentist appointment. I don't know if you've noticed, but the last year I've had Invisalign and today I'm done and I get the little, I'm so <laughs> bored. I'm getting the things taken off and then a couple things filled in. So I doubt I will look much different, um, but in case I do, here's a final look or a first look. Here's a look at my teeth right now. And that'll be filled in. <laughs> We got a whole bunch of rain last night, so I think a bunch of the fire is out. I think we're stopping at Mama's for Mama's and dropping off some blankets and shoes. I think that's the number one thing that they have been seeking. Cause like when you're running out of your house, you think of clothes you need, but maybe you don't think of shoes. Then I don't know, groceries and then home and then reading my book. Our power was off for I think three hours yesterday. I'll see you when my teeth are done. Okay, I'm home. I left Liam at hockey. He's in a camp all week. Uh, he is getting braces next week. And here are my new teeth. Ta-da. <laughs> she filled in a couple uh, little gaps. And yeah, here's where we started. Here's where we're at now. I think it's been 11 months. They definitely feel a little bit strange. Like they seem too perfectly square, but I guess that's how teeth are supposed to look. Okay, here's what you care about the book. It is juicy. I've just flown through the first 10 chapters and I have to check the synopsis to see if what I want to tell you is even in here because the person that took the video at the store has become very involved in the story in a really unexpected way. We've got Alix, that's how she pronounces it, the mother of the child, Briar. And then the um, babysitter's name is Amira. Okay, yeah, it doesn't talk about this person at all, but it does talk about the video going public. And that still hasn't happened halfway through, but we are getting backstory of Alix's life and Amira's current life and how um, they're converging in more ways than just them spending time with the same little girl. One of them a daughter, one of them she's babysitting. And I'm just like desperate to know where it goes. I'm gonna sit here and finish this right now. I cannot put it down. I have to know. I have to know where it's gonna go. I'm so worried for everyone involved. Okay, my final rating of Such a Fun Age is gonna be a four, which matches pretty well with what the first chapter led me to feel. I think the first chapter could have led to this being the simple kind of coming of age story that it was, or like a thriller. And I think I would have also liked it if it went into thriller, like danger, revenge kind of territory. As much as I feel like the synopsis needs to be rewritten because it's not really an accurate depiction of what the book is. At the same time, if it described what the book actually is, less people would be picking it up because it is a lot slower and it feels slice of life and it feels coming of age, even though um, Amira is in her mid twenties. She's just in this really interesting um, non-committal 
I, I guess I would say point in her life where she's not sure what she wants or where she's headed. She even has this very pointed, um, inappropriate kind of interrogation moment with somebody, some random woman at the dinner table um, who's asking her like about her life goals and her aspirations and what she really wants. And all of her friends around her seem to be really succeeding in their jobs and she in their eyes is just babysitting and she just doesn't know where she's headed. And then the people in Amira's life, the white folks that she is surrounded by, um, they take a very big interest in her life a weird amount of interest not in a thriller horror weird direction but just like an uncomfortable amount and that comes along with microaggressions really overstepping at times um, a, a white savior mentality. And it just turned out to be a really interesting read. I cared a lot about these characters. I thought they were really vividly written. Um, it was both like fun and engaging, but infuriating at the same time. And I think the writing is the most impressive thing. I can't really explain it well, but there were moments where she would just put um, like plot development and scene setting in the middle of dialogue. And it just felt really well done. And I'm excited to pick up her next thing next year. We are on a good path for the first chapter matching the overall vibes of the book. And we'll see if it continues with the next one. That was 11 pages and went exactly as I expected. I'm giving it a seven. Like I know I want to read the finale to the series eventually. I still enjoy the characters, but the Dreamer trilogy is just never gonna be as good as the Raven Cycle. We just met a new character who we don't know and I hate when a new character is introduced in the last book. What that did solidify for me is that I absolutely wanna reread the other six books before this one. I have been reading Grey Worm for a couple days now and I'm about to finish it. Um, I'm about to go on reading sprints with my channel members just to hang out for the afternoon while Liam's at hockey. So I'm excited to be done with this. Um, I know what I said in the video is that I wanted to reread everything first. And I actually completely disagree with myself. Maybe I could have reread the first two books in this series, but I will give Maggie Steve Otter some credit that she's recapping it well and gets us right into the action all at the same time and does a great job of that. But I am very glad I didn't just reread The Raven Cycle because I think it would have made it even more blatantly obvious than it is that this series is not this series and that the magic and the characters and the connection is not what she's trying to do with this series. This is plot. This is action. This is just her wanting to get into a different vibe and I wish she had done that with an adult novel instead, or like a standalone. I would love to see her write an adult standalone someday. I think that's the only situation in which I would pick up more from her. Now I know it sounds like I'm saying I'm hating this and I'm not. I think it's gonna be a three by the end. Uh, the first one, Call Down the Hawk, was a four. For some reason I cannot find Mr. Impossible. I must have hidden it somewhere on my shelves and I gave that a three. And I think this is gonna be the same. Plot wise, I just can't tell you anything because it would not only spoil the two books that came before it, but the six books that came before it. So we are following a character named Ronan Lynch and he has a couple brothers. And it's not even really Ronan's story at this point. Um, and all of these character names are gonna mean nothing to you if you haven't read the series, but it's not Ronan's book. It's Carmen's book and it's Jordan's book and it's Hennessy's book and it's Bride's book and it's Declan's book. Declan is his older brother and I remember the first, I think it was the first, it might've been the second, where you get to see Declan in a different light and I really appreciated that. Even though I wanted, like I expected it to be Ronan's story, it's more of the Lynch brothers story and that's fine. But in this one, like Ronan is barely even in it. And as much as I appreciate Maggie Steve Otter writing characters who you previously didn't like and skillfully making you understand them better and come to love them. Like I don't wanna read any more about Declan. <laughs> and the special thing about the Raven Cycle for me is the moments between like two characters at a time. And while there is a big cast in here, the cast in here just doesn't feel as well developed as far as like one-on-one -on -one relationships. If I thought of the Raven, maybe it's because I've read the series so many times, but I could think of any two characters I could think of Gansey and Ronan, or I could think of um, Blue and Noah, I could think of Kala and Adam, and I will remember a specific scene that had those two. Maybe not what happened in it and what they said, but I remember them having these one-on-one -on -one moments and they felt really important. And in here, it's just like 
chaos. There's so many people in every scene and everyone's moving in and out of everything at a speed that I just can't keep up with and I don't really care for. And at this point, it's not about the relationships. So if it's not about that, what I want it to be is about Ronan and his like, because we love him so much, if you've read seven books at this point, like you're here for Ronan and you want to see his reaction to things. You want to see his opinion on things and you don't get that. I just don't think this group of characters is carrying the series the way that the first series did it. And I hate to be constantly comparing them, but like that's the only reason that I read this. If I had read the synopsis of this and it was a brand new book by a brand new author, I never would have picked it up. Like I'm here because I love the vibes of the Raven Cycle. And I appreciate so much stuff that there's not a ton of fan service in here. She's not constantly bringing in old characters or old conversations. Um, it is aged up, which I appreciate. We are getting more explanation of the magic and there's so many things going on that I enjoy, but the plot itself is just like, so uninteresting at this point. I think she's also introducing way too many new ideas, which is the exact same thing that happened with The Raven King. It's like, once you're getting to the final book, why are you introducing new characters, new ideas, whole new plot lines? I know it sounds like I'm ranting, but the things that I would tell you I am liking, that's in spoiler territory. So I think it's fine. I'm gonna go drop Liam off at hockey, take a breather, come back to it, and hopefully finish it on a good note, and we get some ending moments um, that are special. Hello besties. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I feel like I never see you on a Friday afternoon. Um, so it's exciting that we're here together to read and accomplish our goals. We will be starting reading sprints in about five, 10 minutes. We're gonna start with a 40 minute one. Um, I have a lot of things to accomplish today. I'm currently reading Grey Warren and I need to finish it. And then I'm gonna hop right into Winter Counts after that. I, what else? I have a package we can open together. Um, I just stopped at Starbucks and while I'm not a pumpkin spice girly, I am a pumpkin loaf girly. So I've got a good snack, I hope you do too. I also just printed out all of the newest members TBR jar submissions. There's 120 new besties. And so I need to cut all of these up and add them to the TBR jar, which is definitely um, a little bit full. <laughs> so that's what we're up to today. Let me know what you're gonna be reading. So yeah, at the end of the day, I am gonna give Grey Warren a three. I feel like the series overall just wasn't totally for me, but I understand people loving it. And I do like all of the Brothers Lynch. The epilogue um, was a little cheesy, a little silly. I could see other people would like it though. I feel like I would still recommend the series to people or rather I wouldn't go out of my way to dissuade anyone from it. That's what I should say. I'm now almost done with my members TBR jar editions. And I, yeah, I just don't really have anything else to say about the book. Um, my review for the final book of the Raven cycle was just not enough squash song, which is why I got a four. That's not why it got a four. And the rest of the series got a five, um, but I just feel like the last book in the series lacked a little bit. I feel the same about this one. And as far as like Squash Song, that's just something that is kind of a fun little nod that comes up once in a while in the books. And I felt like Maggie Seabutter just kind of forgot about her audience in the last book of The Raven Cycle. And I kind of feel the same about this one. Like there were some references to older things, but not as many as I thought. And Again, like a little nod to Opal, more of a nod to Chainsaw. I just needed some more things that made me feel like she wasn't just trying to get the series done with already. My fall TBR will be up in a couple weeks, um, but members will have early access and extra access to some secret plans that I have. Now I'm gonna continue with my next book, Winter Counts. I do think it's interesting that at this point in the vlog, 
Um, it hasn't been perfectly with my predictions. However, it has been like the one that had the best first chapter was the best. The next best chapter was the next rated lowest and then and the next one followed. So like they've all lined up properly, even if they're not perfectly matching the numbers that I've been giving. So that should mean that Winter Counts gets a lower rating than any of them, which obviously I hope isn't the case, but this is what I'm going to get into next. I think I have the audiobook. This first chapter was five pages. I've had a lot of people recommend this to me as a revenge kind of story. It really got intense right off the bat. There was this man standing outside a local bar waiting for a guy to leave and then he just like beat the absolute snot out of him. He talked about how horrible of a person he was, um, how he was in, has been inappropriate with children. Obviously this is going to have a good intent. I just don't know how it's going to handle certain topics or how abruptly and bluntly it's bringing all of these storylines in. I gave it a six. Okay, we just did some great reading sprints. Everybody accomplished a lot. And we also planned a little members readathon. It's gonna be spanning like multiple seasons, which is fun. Um, anyway, I've gotten into, speaking of seasons, Winter Counts. Uh, the audiobook said I was at chapter nine. So that's about 70 pages in. And we've gotten beyond the like, aggressive opener. And what's happening right now is we're following this man and the reason it opened that way where he was like threatening somebody was that is kind of what people hire him um, to do is things that the police won't necessarily take care of or tribal council won't take care of. So people who've done bad things and need their comeuppance. Uh, and the story here is gonna follow him taking down uh, some drug dealers. He wants to find the origin of drugs in the community and it hits close to home for him because we just read in the last chapter his nephew overdosing. He survived and he ended up getting to tell him who sold him the drugs. And it's definitely reminding me right now of a mix of Razor Blade Tears by S.A. Cosby because of the revenge and it's following like older men. And then also Firekeeper's Daughter, obviously, because this has to do with um, a mystery and drug dealing in the community. And I gave these both like two and three stars respectively, though I really respect what they did and I recommend them to people all the time. They just weren't exactly my, to my, taste. The conversations were, but the plot itself just wasn't my favorite. And I think I was already getting these vibes from the synopsis itself, which is why maybe I was weary of it. But I'm really interested at this point of what's going to go down, what he's going to find out, uh, the investigation that he's going to go on and what he's going to learn and how he's going to handle it all. So I will keep reading and I'll keep you updated. All right, I'm calling it a night for this. I... I'm interested enough. I'm stopping around two thirds of the way in. I'm gonna finish it tomorrow. Maybe there's just not that much crime fiction I read that doesn't revolve around murder and like we're solving a death throughout it that I find myself a little bored by just like trying to track a person down for a long time. And all of the intricacies with like working with the police department and becoming an informant and everything involved in that, that I'm not finding it the most like fascinating read, but there's nothing wrong with it. So I'm gonna go get a good night's sleep and then wake up and read the rest. So I finished Winter Counts pretty early this morning. And then as soon as I went to update you, there was this man jackhammering outside of my window and he has been doing so for six hours straight. Even though looking out now, his like driveway barely looks any different. So I don't even know what he was doing, but I think he's done and I can give you my final review of this. Why I've, while I've been waiting, I have gotten pretty decently into my last book. So that's exciting. And I'll tell you about it in just a second. My final rating of Winter Counts is gonna be uh, three. I feel like it's pretty much on par with the villa and Grey Warren as far as enjoyment. I liked following Virgil. I think he was an interesting and complex character. And then he ends up like going on this kind of road trip and tracking down um, the drug situation with his ex-girlfriend Marie and they're working together for this common goal. But they have kind of different motivations and that's what was the most interesting thing about this is a lot of time in these road trip stories where there's two people, they have really similar personalities and a goal that they're both accomplishing the same motives and they're like working together. Even if they have drastically different personalities. I wouldn't say they have super different personalities but their motives themselves are different. Virgil doesn't feel necessarily connected to the Lakota community and the spiritual practices and it was really interesting seeing his journey and connection throughout the story. Though he has a lot of relationships with people still and he is like a vigilante um, within 
the community. He feels more of like one-on-one -on -one connections with people and feels a strong urge to help individuals and also it's like for himself doing this work. Meanwhile his like partner is very much about the community and everything for the greater good of the reservation and therefore doesn't even see Virgil himself and his struggles as like the most important thing. Doesn't acknowledge his individual needs and so that's how they play off of each other in a really interesting way. Kind of getting to figure out what the other person is working towards and honestly like butting heads a lot trying to figure this whole thing out. Like I thought at the beginning, I would say if you were a big fan of Razor Blade Tears, this is something I would recommend to you. It's no doubt less action heavy, but it feels really similar in tone. I would find myself recommending this to people for sure. For me, it was a little predictable. It was kind of easy to put down a lot until the ending and the ending was great. Um, and the whole like last third of it and all the things that it was saying brought it to the solid three that it's at. And so thankfully we have not continued to dip throughout. This one isn't, or is it perfectly matched? This is the one that I gave a six, right? Which is a three. And then I gave it a three. Yeah, so this one, the first chapter, I guess did indicate my enjoyment of the story by the end. Now Skyward might be circumstantial. If you watched a recent video of mine that I did, I was talking about how my attention span is not really here right now. And I feel that way, especially with science fiction and fantasy. So I am gonna give this a five. Because like with other first chapters, I just feel like we got dropped in to so much information that I actually started skimming the prologue because it was so long. And then the first chapter was following Spensa and she was talking about all of like the history of war and battling and pilots. And now tomorrow she's going for her pilot test to see if she can join in on the fight and this protection that she needs to provide. We met her mom and her grandma and their history with providing peace to everyone. And I think this is one of those ones where she will learn, you know, the way that she was raised and the things that she learned is not totally the reality and that there's other things going on between like two battling places. Or maybe it's just the story of her protecting everybody from these terrible evil alien whatever. So I am already 17 chapters or 150 pages into Skyward today and I'm really liking it so thank goodness for that. I, it has been a little while since I've had to learn any new science fiction terminology or magic systems and I think that is what's leading to me enjoying it because my mind my mind is here for it. It definitely feels very inspired by Top Gun, but maybe that's just because I haven't really watched any other things in a similar vein. And so like the pilots and the training and the, you know, your parent used to be a part of this organization and everybody is judging them or like something happened in their past and now you have to follow in their footsteps or you have to live up to a certain something. My only qualm I think at this point is I, I really hope there's something surprising about this because right now it seems like a really straightforward story. So we're following Spensa and her dad died and he's known as somebody who like abandoned ship and um, was a coward and that has followed her her entire life. And now she has the opportunity to become a pilot like him and nobody wants her there. People are making it really hard for her to be a part of this um, training situation and only a couple people are even going to make it to be full pilots one day. So for me looking at the trajectory of the story it feels like it's going to be this you know her gaining strength and within herself and physically and the book opens up with a lot of times of her talking about how she's throwing a fit and she's having a tantrum and she's so immature and how she acknowledges that about herself and then we're going to get to see her have these moments later where she goes I could have had a fit right now and I'm choosing not to and then maybe learning about her um, kind of partners, the other people in training and changing her expectations of them. And then she's obviously going to learn at some point that her dad wasn't actually a coward and like everything that she understood is going to be flipped on its head. Because like what else would be the storyline and the purpose of all of that? So since I've never read any other Brandon Sanderson and everyone says that his stuff is so good, I am giving him the benefit of the doubt that it's going to get great. Like right now it's good, 
but it needs like twists and turns and reveals and stuff. And I'm banking on that. I think he's going to do that because right now it just feels like a really kind of basic story, but everybody loves it so much. So I can't imagine it not going well. I'm calling it a night at chapter 33. So I have this much to read tomorrow and then I want to get this video up on the same day. So hopefully that's reasonable. At this point, we're following the same thing we were from the beginning. Like, obviously we still have the main character and she's working through her dynamics with the group and some kind of uh, dangerous, deadly things have gone down. Uh, we have the same main question that we had at the beginning though. Like everybody who's making her time difficult at the training, is it because they don't want her um, and her lineage to be a part of it because they don't trust her because they couldn't trust her father? Or is there something more underground happening that people are trying to cover up? Something that I'm really enjoying is there's an element that I feel like might be a spoiler, but there is a character that gets introduced that is not uh, fully human and I'm finding that to be definitely my favorite element and I could see if that was the case for other people as well. Yeah I'm definitely enjoying it more than I was that first chapter because I have been slowly let in on everything. The writing is good, the pace is good, I just want something to really capture my attention so I'll let you know if it does that tomorrow. I was feeling really confident with a 3 or 3.5 by the end as I was reading this. I think that Spensa is gonna be a really I mean so many people have read this so Spensa is a really familiar character for a lot of readers I think she is easy to get into the mind of and easy to understand she feels like she has a lot to prove to Skyward Flight itself and everyone she's working with um, at the beginning of the book not everybody knows who she is so it's her opportunity to be someone new for the first time and not immediately go into a situation being judged um, but then also her like teacher she needs to prove something to them and she needs to prove something to herself that she's not a coward that whole idea comes up a lot the idea of people being cowards or being brave and putting themselves in unsafe situations to avoid being labeled as a coward or somebody who abandoned uh, the society i think with the age range that it's in the world building makes sense and i appreciate it at the same time as wanting more but I see how it could be overwhelming. And I say a lot in science fiction that like there was too much, like I learned too much. I didn't need to know all of that. And so knowing that this is a huge spanning series, um, obviously we're gonna learn so much more. I don't actually think I'm gonna continue in the series, but reading the last two chapters made this a four. And I'm happy for the people reading on that there is so much more and this feels like a setup for something else. There were some reveals, there was just this kickoff to an entirely different potential plot. And that makes me excited for this series to exist. We have such a limited perspective of this world. There's like people in caverns and um, they're, they can't go beyond a certain place. And there's this group called the Krell and a lot of the book is analyzing um, like war behavior and battle plans and how their ships behave and how we need to avoid this and go this way and how our formation, all of our different strengths in this class um, can accomplish certain goals. There was just a lot of that, which totally makes sense. And then Spensa going off on her own learning lessons about her father, about the, you know, society itself. I just wanted more about the society outside of just Spence's perspective. I want to know more about how we got here and how everything looks and how different groups and clans are engaging. I want to know those things, but not enough to read on, I don't think. But I am happy that this is a four because something that I didn't mention also in this video is that this is pulled out of my members TBR jar and I have to have 50% good reads pulled from the TBR jar in order to continue this on to next year. And at this point, I think we have a five to three ratio, which is very exciting. So people are continually picking things that they know I'll like. And I think that this is the only book of the rankings from this video that I have liked more than the first chapter indicated. So let's quickly do a little spreadsheet situation because I have successfully completed six books for this video, which means I now have a sample size of 30 that we can look at. So let's fill in the ratings. Leech, I did give a five. Such a Fun Age was a four. The Villa was a three. Grey Warren was a three. Winter Counts was a three. And Skyward was a four. Now, obviously, no matter what, we cannot definitively say the first chapter will indicate the overall rating of the book. 
that's off the table, but I do think we see a general trend towards success. So what I put here is this is intrigue out of 10, which was my original rating. And then this is just dividing it by two. So it's out of five because my ratings are out of five. And I think what we need to do here is see the difference. So let's take all of these and divide it by the actual rating. You might see this one is coming up as an error because I haven't talked about people we meet on vacation in a video yet, but I will. And I think what you could say is obviously if it's a one, there was no change. The first chapter of The Last Night of the Telegraph Club was a four, I gave it a four. The first chapter of A Mind Spread on the Ground was a five, I gave the book a five. So eight of the 30 were perfectly accurate. And then going from a five for the first chapter to a four isn't that big of a jump. So I think we could go up to like a 1.4 and we could say that all of these ones are relatively accurate. And then going the other direction of 0.8 is pretty decent. The biggest differences seem to be with horror. Like I thought the hollow kind might be a five star because the first chapter was a five star, but it ended up being a three. I think that far of a difference we could call a fail. Bad Cree was a three. The first chapter is a 4.5. That feels kind of far. Again, with horror, a house with good bones, the first chapter was a five and I gave it a two. The difference between a two and a five is so substantial that we're calling that a fail. So that means we're also calling Black Tide a fail because that was a two. And so looking at it like this, it doesn't look too bad. Only a couple were big flops when I thought they'd be huge wins. A couple like bad guesses from me or the first chapter just did not indicate how the entire book was written. But like we're in the green for a lot of this. So I do think going forward with my plan of reading the things on the top shelf of my TBR that I gave the first chapter a really high rating and I'm still excited about, I think we could look at that and say, yeah, those probably are gonna end up being highly rated for me by the end. And maybe I am justified in ignoring the bottom shelf a little bit unless I'm forced to read them for videos. Now, obviously we can see here that there are outliers and it all comes down to personal taste and preference, obviously, but thank you for hanging out with me for this vlog. Uh, let me know any of your thoughts on the books that I read and I will see you later. Bye.